Welcome, everyone. Today I'm with uh, Dr. David Bronstein, who is really kind enough to join us from a conference that he's attending uh, to educate, for, continue his education, and, and really spend some time with us to help bring us up to speed on this really important uh, nuclear crisis that's uh, in Japan and its impact on the United States. And you know, for those in the United States, and then certainly other uh, information for those of you who are other places. But um, Dr. Brownstein has uh, extensive clinical experience uh, with iodine, and it's particularly useful in this scenario. So there'll be other information other than the nuclear crisis that uh, he'll be willing to share with us. So welcome, Dr. Brownstein. Thank you for having me, Dr. McCullough. All right. So uh, why don't you describe to our listeners your experience uh, with iodine and, and that really gives you a, a, a valuable perspective in this situation that uh, can help us understand what might be an appropriate response. Well, I've been interested in the use of iodine for approximately the last 20 years. In the first 10 years of my holistic practice, I saw so many patients with thyroid disorders that I was searching for the underlying reason or reasons why so many people were having thyroid problems, and it always came back to iodine at some point. And I would try various amounts of iodine in my patients, and although I wasn't seeing negative effects with it, I just wasn't seeing the positive effects. And approximately 10 years ago, I read an article in one of the journals um, from Dr. Guy Abraham, who developed an iodine loading test, and I became friendly with him and began using his test and finding a vast majority of my patients were severely deficient in iodine. And when he educated me about the right forms of iodine to use, and I began using the right forms of iodine, then I began seeing the positive res uh, results in my practice. And so far between myself and my partners, We've tested over 5,000 patients with either a spot uh, urinary test for iodine or a 24-hour urinary iodine loading test and found over 95% of patients moderate to severely deficient in iodine. And we've just seen the good clinical results over the years of using iodine. And now it's really become, iodine's become to the forefront with this nuclear crisis in Japan. Yes, and I think that's really the key is the... Uh is to understanding this process. So I wonder if you could describe a little more detail the uh, the test, the iodine spot test that you're using and the uh, the iodine urine test, because many people are doing this self-diagnosis where they're applying some iodine topically and seeing how long it takes to disappear. Is, is that the spot test you're using, or is there a different variation of it? Well, the skin test that you're describing is really uh, a useless test. And That's what I there thought. are studies That's that show that 80% of the iodine sublimates off into a gaseous state and leaves the skin. Um, I don't find that clinically useful. The test that I'm talking about is either a spot urinary iodine test where you just measure the morning urine and see how much iodine is in there, and it gives you an idea of the dietary iodine intake from somebody, or a 24-hour iodine loading test where somebody takes a known amount of iodine, collects 24 hours of urine, and you measure how much iodine is excreted, and you can calculate how much the body retains. And from that, you can estimate how deficient somebody is in iodine. Those are the two tests that I'm using, and I find those two tests both clinically helpful in diagnosing as well as treating someone for iodine deficiency. Yeah, it seems the latter would be more useful because if someone were to take a large dose of iodine initially, the spot test could be falsely accurate or falsely elevated, whereas it, they, it would be sufficient as to the, it was relative to the last one, which would be more reflective of the long-term status. I would totally agree with that, although... With over 95% of patients yeah. moderate to severely iodine yeah. deficient, the spot urinary iodine test, as long as they're not taking iodine, can be an accurate indicator of the body iodine status. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of another uh, nutrient that we're both, I'm sure, in agreement on, that's vitamin D. And it is my belief, certainly not some of the so-called quote-unquote experts, uh, that that about the same amount of people are iod uh, vitamin D deficient. Uh, but it, it really depends on what you use as a standard. You know, because a lot, if you're using 20 or 30 nanograms as a standard, you're going to get a little different than using 50 nanograms. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting. So the biggest c clinical condition that you see from, I mean, this is really an extraordinary uh, observation. They have, you know, 19 people out of 20 be deficient in this really important nutrient. Do you have, uh, and can you, well, first of all, can you describe the, comp, the, the implications of being deficient and then what you believe might have led to that deficiency? Because it really, I mean, that's just really extraordinary that many people not have enough of that nutrient. 
Well, Dr. McCola, I've lectured across the country and out of the country, and I, I ask all the practitioners in my lectures, um, wh what percent of people do they think are walking around with thyroid issues? And invariably, the number comes up with usually the minimum around 50% and the maximum around 75 to 80%. So if we have 50 to 80% of our population with an undiagnosed abnormal thyroid function, we've got a big problem in our country. And we've got a problem that's being driven, I think, in part from iodine deficiency. And the thyroid gland has the largest concentration of iodine. We can't make thyroid hormone from without iodine. And I think that this is one large piece of the puzzle why so many people are having thyroid problems. But it's not just the thyroid gland that has iodine. All the glandular tissue does. The breast, the ovaries, the uterus, the prostate, um, and other tissues. The skin holds 20% of the body's iodine. The fat and the muscle cells hold large amounts of iodine. Um, so iodine is concentrated in every cell of the body. Every cell needs and utilizes iodine. The white blood cells can't function without adequate iodine. I mean, the list goes on and on. Iodine is a very important nutrient for the body. And when it's deficient, there are ramp wide ramifications in the body of what can happen. Okay. Would well, you have any speculation as to why we're so deficient? Well, I think that... Uh, we're, I think this deficiency has been going on a long time, but now this deficiency is being exacerbated by the toxicities we're exposed to. The fluoride in our water supply uh, will bind to iodine receptors and cause the body to release iodine. Bromide, which I have found in every patient that I've tested for bromide, which has been nearly 500, um, they've been high on bromide levels. Bromide is a halogen that can bind to iodine receptors and also cause the body to lose iodine. Chlorine derivatives, um, which are found in uh, pesticides and insecticides, can bind to iodine sites and cause the body to release iodine. And I think that our exposure to these items have gone up dramatically in the last 20 to 30 years, causing this iodine deficiency problem to markedly worsen. And I think that's the 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 problem that we're seeing today. And and I think the the consequences of this are one in seven women having breast cancer, one in three men having prostate cancer, and this this huge chronic illness problem that we're seeing that's not being addressed by conventional medicine. I couldn't agree more. So, and just for those of our listeners who aren't familiar, brom why, why we would be having high levels of bromine, because you don't think you're normally exposed to it, but for anyone who's eating uh, white flour products, uh, usually brom bromine is used to bleach the flour, and not only produces bromine, but produces uh, brominated halogen, uh, other uh, organic chemicals, which are pr probably even worse. And bromine is also found in, in many um, soft drinks, such as Mountain Dew and some Gatorade products and AMP energy drink. Um, we're getting bromine from a wide exposure in our food supply, and, you know, it's just been a disaster. And uh, it's, it, bromine will bind to wherever iodine binds to in the body. Thyroid hormone can be brominated instead of iodinated if there's too much bromine in the body. Unfortunately, our common laboratory tests don't distinguish between the two, so we don't really know in most people what's happening. But my testing of patients has shown generally the sicker they are, the higher the bromide levels are. And if they have cancer, one of the endocrine cancers, such as breast or prostate or uterine um, or thyroid cancer, they have higher levels than patients without those cancers. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a, it's a variety, it's not just a simple deficiency or an inadequate intake of iodine, but uh, the exposure to these relative toxins that we typically didn't have because almost everyone's drinking or exposed to fluoridated water and the bromine that you mentioned and the chlorine, of course. So that's displacing it, making it re giving us a relatively increased requirement for iodine to replace the ones that were exposed to those toxins that we're influenced by. So it's the combination. You uh, hit the nail on the head. Yeah, so thank you for helping us and me understand that better. Uh, so the reason for the primary reason for the call uh, was to have some solid recommendations to really address the fear because I think this is a from my perspective I don't believe this is a that the nuclear crisis in Japan is going to impact the, the people in the United States hardly at all if at all but it's good in that it sensitizes to this issue we could we could address because there may be another nuclear reactor within the United States that does present this problem where it is an issue but from my understanding you really it's probably not wise to take a large dose of potassium iodide to protect yourself from this cloud unless you have high radiation levels because it's only going to give you protection for one to three days at most and it's really not going to solve any long-term problems and, and I'm wondering if you could if you could we could have your perspective on that 
Well, we're certainly not going to feel the the nuclear uh, the the radiation fallout that the Japanese are going to feel. But if this number four reactor melts down, or if it's not already melting down, although it's hard to tell from what the Japanese government is releasing, we are going to get some of that exposure. And the problem with even a mild exposure of radioactive iodine coming over the northern United States is not for those people who are iodine sufficient, it's for those people who are iodine deficient. If that, if that radioactivity comes down in the form of rain or mist or hail or something like that, those patients' bodies who are iodine deficient will bind that up and it will cause some problems. I agree with you. I do not think we're going to see the white health crises we're seeing in Japan but this will be just another drop in our toxicity environment. And for those who are iodine deficient, um, there are probably are some consequences to that. And that's why I said at the beginning of the call, I hope this is a wake-up call to those who, um, who have been emailing me and who are concerned about iodine, that we should take precautions before events like this happen. We should eat a better diet. We should keep ourselves hydrated. We should take the right kind of salt in our diet. We should... Make sure that our bodies have enough iodine and enough vitamin C to survive crises like this. And that's what our bodies are looking for. And if you have that in your, in your body, you don't have to worry about a crisis in Japan. Sure. 